There's a lot of small businesses that need a little push. That's a lot of eggs. There's time and a place for it. But when I want it, I want it. Your big brother will come through. I mean, yeah. people will say anything. I mean, my goodness. Get the Florida eye roll. I've seen that. I'm going to be a cook. No, Why not? Hey, this is a problem. This is a problem. This is a problem. You're listening to The Hot Sauce Show, the place to meet hot sauce makers and enthusiasts. Let's jump right in. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Hot Sauce Show. My name is Zach, and I'm your host. And today we have Big Rich. And uh, Rich, we're excited to have you here today. Fantastic. I am excited to be here. Yeah, I, I've actually been really looking forward to this episode because, you know, I know a little lot a bit about your channel and what you have done and what you do for small food business in the area. And that really resonates with me because one of the reasons we started the show was to promote specifically hot sauce makers and kind of the smaller boutique um, sauces and meet with them, learn about them. And I feel like um, your channel and your enormous following um, that you have does that for local food trucks and and, and um, other restaurants here. So I'm I'm really excited to, to learn more about it. Um, why don't you tell our viewers what Big Rich Knows Jax is? So Big Rich Knows Jax is my way of giving back to the community. Um, it's to shine a spotlight on like local businesses. Uh, very food heavy because I have a background in food myself. Uh, so I want to extend that passion that I have to other people. And I see the passion that a lot of people put in their businesses, their restaurants, their food. And I like to give back to the community in that way. So I like to like get people out of their comfort zone and try something new, try something local, uh, mom and pop shops, local hidden gyms, hole in the wall spots, places that, that don't get the limelight like a lot of the commercial businesses do, right? They don't, you know, have the budget to do like advertising, right? Fast foods on the corner, you know it, but it's like, hey, go, go one more block, yeah. down and yeah, because you know who's making a really good, you know, and like I want to make yeah. sure that people know that there's other things besides, you know, what's in this area, yes. you know, like I lived in Jacksonville my whole life. Like I was born and raised in Jacksonville, so obviously Big Rich knows Jackson's me telling you, hey, I know Jacksonville. You know, if, if I don't know where it, where it is, it must have just happened. happened. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. You're like the mayor of food. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been told, I've called a lot of things. Uh, I've been told I've been called a lot of things with, you know, with, with my travels, but um, I, I kind of, you know, molded myself kind of, uh, you know, uh, have some of the other food, you know, from the food network and stuff like that. Um, obviously Guy Fieri has like a, like a, an, an, you know, some, a symbolic, um, I guess you could say like I kind of use him as a guide mm -hmm. because he basically travels around and right. tries new places. But what he does is the mom and pop shops, mm -hmm. the local hidden gems. And I'm like, well, if I, I can't do it on his level, at least I can do it locally where I grew up. Right. Which is just as powerful because there's a lot of people here and a lot of businesses right. and, and doing it on that kind of micro level. It's almost like um, you have... I don't want to say more dedicated fans, but it's like, okay, if you're a fan of, you know, guy show... All right, I, I you know I went to the two in my neighborhood, and then maybe I'll hit the other ones if I happen to be in Oklahoma one day. Right. <laughs> Whereas you have, you know, I'm a fan, and it's like, okay, you, you know, every week you're a new place. I could be going to that every single place, exactly. which is great. It, it's not just you know that you know the people that can travel that can go try to a new place every you know every time they want to find something new. It's I live local or people who are moving to Jacksonville, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, obviously we're a military town. Mm -hmm. um, I come from a military background, like my grand, my grandfather, my, my uncles, my, my father was in the Navy. So obviously that's what brought us here. Um, well, brought them here and I was born here. But so people are coming here left and right that don't know Jacksonville. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I want to be, you know, kind of be that guide and, and help them find places that, you know, a lot of people don't know about or they've forgotten about. Right. So you said you had kind of experience in the food space before you got into promoting these small businesses. So what what specifically was that? So I, back in my day, I went back in the <laughs> early days. So I actually went to culinary school okay. and I graduated and spent seven years as a chef myself. Um, I had a car accident that took me out of that career path. Even though I still, you know, I, I still love to cook, you know, I can't do it professionally on that level anymore, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so I had to find a new route and then I got into sales and marketing and, and things of that nature. And it just, you know, I still have that passion for cooking and I still see the passion in other people's eyes. And, you know, when they put their passion on a plate and they hand it to you and say, enjoy, I want other people to know how that feels. Right. So whenever I shine a spotlight on these restaurants, 
and get them a new customer, I want that customer to have that experience as well. Right. And so, yeah, so, you know, even though I can't do it professionally anymore, um, I still want other people to thrive and, and, you know, and do what they love doing. Yeah. No, I love that. And, and it's so many great things in so many different places that always, you know, you have kind of a background in one thing and then you get kind of detoured on that, but then you have something else and right. then you kind of have taken both of these paths now and brought them back together, right. which is, which is perfect. And then having a whole another level of appreciation and um, empathy or being empathetic with these restaurant folks and the, the people that are visiting. And I think that's, that's amazing. How do you choose? So I know you have like a Rolodex of just, I think you were saying before <laughs> we started here, like a Rolodex of all your, your spots. How do you, how do you find these new places? Are people sending them to you or do you kind of, are you sniffing them out? How does that work? So I firmly believe that, you know, you should always take a look around whenever you're driving in a new neighborhood. Um, yes, I get invited to places. I get like people will DM me and say, hey, have you tried this place? So there's a number of ways that I find new spots. Um, and, you know, I kind of just take those and put them on my list and say, if I'm on this side of town, I'll try to go to this place this week, you know. Um, I never know where I'm going to be. Um, I do a lot of consulting and um, I work with a lot of like different like small restaurants and consulting and uh, marketing and promotions. And um, so I never know what side of town I'm going to be on. So mm -hmm. I know there's a, a restaurant somewhere. Yeah. And so I try to I try to go through my list, say, OK, I'm on this side of town today. I'm hungry. Let's see what's on this side of town. So you get kind of like a, a working list going. Yes. And like I said, I get you know, excited whenever, you know, there's a new place opening up, especially if it's a mom and pop, yeah. you know, if, if I, if it's a, you know, local spot, um, you know, there's a time and a place for the commercial and the, yeah. the big, big franchises. I have no problem with them. They but started somewhere. Yeah. A lot of them started somewhere yeah. and everybody has to start somewhere. So, um, the goal is, is to help the smaller businesses keep that level and keep their you know, food on their own table mm -hmm. um, by getting other people to support them as well. If a new place opened up, do you tell them you're coming or do you just show up or? And like I said, if they, unless they invite me, you'll just show up. Typically I just show up. They know who you are. Like I, well, some of them do yeah. like, pr I prefer that they don't. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, like there are some times when people invite me and they'll, you know, offer me, you know, some things to try and I'll, and I'll go to those as well. But I still go to these places that don't know me, preferably, and I go and I put my money down just like anyone else, sure. and I want them to give me the normal treatment like on any other customer because yeah. I feel that my page is a little different um, because I want I want authenticity in my in my review or you know my spotlights that I put out there. I want people to know I tried this myself. You know, it wasn't just a bunch of food being handed to right. me. I I actually went in there and I ordered this, and this is what I enjoyed go try it for yourself or go try mm -hmm. something else in, on the menu that you might like. Mm -hmm. um, because I want to see, make sure that if I put something on my social media, that other people are going to get the exact same plate. They're going to get the exact same treatment that I got because I don't want special treatment when it comes to me going, just stepping in there. Right. And if right. they, if they do recognize me, you know, I'll let them know, Hey, look, I'm You're like, Oh, that's my twin. No, it's, <laughs> I'm John. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just I say, look, please don't do anything special to yeah. what just make it like you normally would because, and I explained to them, my followers, I want them to see how you do it. Right. I want them to see how you do it for anyone else because. Right. You, you don't want to, you know, brawl the red carpet for you because no. then you do what you do and put it on social media and then you don't want people going there expecting that. Right. I want them to get whatever I saw, what they saw on my page. So if whatever, however my plate looks, that's how it should look every single time. And that's why I always. Whenever I consult with certain like new restaurants, when you know, and I you know they ask me you know what would I do what would I do different? I always tell them you know what I would do different because I have the background mm -hmm. and presentation is a big thing with me. Mm -hmm. You know because of my background, you know I look for that presentation. Literally what it looks like, what it looks like on the plate because we eat with our eyes. Yes, which is a big part of social media. We eat with our eyes, so with foodie pages, that's why pictures are very important. Mm -hmm. And so I always try to take pictures with, with most of my posts as well as video. Um, so people can actually like focus on it and they don't have to, right. you know, they don't have to just watch it fly by when on the video. Um, I try to like do the reels as well as the carousel post. I try mm -hmm. to do it, do it all. Variety. Yeah. No, that's a great point where yeah, on social media, they can see it 
and they can hear what you're saying, but yeah. the visual is so much stronger yes. than the, the words. Um, but you, you brought up something really interesting that I hadn't really even thought about or knew that you did a lot of with the consulting. So I'm really curious with that. I'm assuming it's restaurants generally coming to you like you're, they, you got so much that they just come to you. You're not really seeking them out, right? No, I don't, I'm, I'm not really like selling myself on. But they're like, hey, can you? Right, and exactly. So, so what are like the top five things that restaurants come to you? Actually, I got kind of two parts of this. What are the top, <laughs> this is really interesting to me. Sure. What, are, what are the top five things that restaurants come to you with and then kind of back at them, you're like, well, here's what you're worried, what you're worried about, but what you should really be worried about. How often do those match up? Um, yeah, occasionally, like they are focused on the wrong things. Um, it's they're mo more focused on how do we get more customers in our store, and that's that's a good op option to have, you know. But what you really want to focus on is what do we do when we get when they come in the store? What do we come when they come in the restaurant? Um, is our presentation the best? Is our flavors the best? Are we, you know, at 100% of where we need to be, you know, on customer service, on hospitality, on attentiveness? You know, if you're a, if you're a table service, you know, restaurant, you need to make sure that your servers are attentive and they're, they're do, they know their stuff. And that's very important when it comes to uh, a return customer. They want to see that exact same thing. And that's why I explained to them that once you get the customers in, then what? Now... Do a lot of restaurant owners acknowledge that, or are you kind of have to lead them down that path? Uh, it's a it's a it's a both both situation. Sometimes you know you have some restaurant owners are restaurant owners because they're great chefs or great cooks, right? But like an not, artist, but not the best front of the house people. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between back of the house and front of the house, which yep. I've worked both. And so I explained to them that you know you need somebody in the front that's covering that part of it making sure that people are getting served and taken care of. And the, before that plate goes out to the table, that it looks good, that it's, everything's on, on, the, on the plate that's supposed to be on there. You know, expediting is, is, a, is a, a gift on all in itself. It's a, it's a skill. I mean, if you know how to do that, the front of the house will be taken care of as the back of the house will con continue to uh, prepare the food. I'm sure you tell them with a lot of them coming to you with like, we need to get – we need to get more people through the door because they're thinking money and yeah, that, that sure, makes total yeah. sense and it's super important. But Absolutely. I'm sure even though you're giving them something a little bit different, you're saying, hey, fix these things and right. that will solve the number one problem. It's yes. not, you know, it's not throw more money at ads. It's not, right. you know, have longer restaurant hours. Like right. people want to come. They will make time to come. Like there's some restaurants here I won't name specifically but sure. that have very narrow windows yes. to get there <laughs> and yeah. you know you know what I'm talking about if you're not there within like 30 minutes after they open it's an hour long line right so or you know they you know they're they're open for lunch they close and yep. they're open for dinner cuz you know obviously we know staffing is an issue yes and so yeah, you have to, and you also have to be consistent with your hours. And if you're, if you say you're going to be open at this time, you need to be open at that time, right? You know, for your customers to come through. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think overall, my my suggestion to any restaurant or business in general is consistency. It's consistency. Make sure that once you set something in motion, you're consistent with it. You know, because. That's what that's what I as a customer and that's what I, I I appreciate consistency most of all. Which is what people glue to fast food for. Yeah. I just know I'm gonna it's, go through McDonald's. It's not my first choice, but yeah, I know how long the drive through is gonna take. I know what it's gonna taste like. I know I, can, I know what those nuggets are gonna like, taste yes. like. I know what that's that sweet and sour sauce is gonna taste like. Yeah. So that's what you have to make sure that whenever you're making a meal and you have a recipe, you gotta make sure that somebody's following that recipe. If you're not in the kitchen cooking it yourself, you need to make sure they're following your recipe yeah. to the letter because that customer that, that loved your, your, your dish wants to come back and try that dish or they want somebody else to come back and try that dish with them. They want to make sure it tastes the exact same way. Yeah. And if it doesn't, then they're going to be disappointed. And the last thing you want as, from a customer is disappointment. Yeah. That's actually one of my big personal, personal pet peeves about myself is I go to a restaurant I find something I like, yes. and then I can't get off it. Like yeah. every time I go, I'm like, "That's what I'm getting. That's what I'm getting. That's yeah. what I'm getting." I look at the menu, I'm like, 
this works. This is why I'm here. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm a creature of habit myself, yeah. man. I tell you, I, there's, there's so many times where I, I, I go to the same restaurants a lot because they're my favorites and they're close to my house or something, but it's like, I, I, I need to get off of that. Cause I need to do, go try something new. Um, but I like them because they're consistent Yeah. because I know that I can get that exact same taco or that exact same plate of barbecue. And I know what it's going to taste like because they're consistent. Yeah. All right. We have three sauces today to try. Um, we're gonna we're gonna start easy with you. Um, the <laughs> first one is hot and saucy uh, sauce maker. Her name is Sam. Uh, fantastic sauces. Uh, the one we right have on. here specifically is a carrot and chipotle. Oh, um, okay. Extremely flavor forward, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to get into this. So I like wanna, the I like the bottle. That yeah, the artworks the artworks really great. That's cool. And um, yeah, it she, definitely screams you know female owned, woman owned, yep. and then. Like lets you know what's in the actual sauce. Yes. Nothing, nothing hidden or anything like that. That's yes, cool. absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And this is a, a great one for fall and fall and winter. So, all right, grab a spoon there. All right, I think I'm gonna go purple. Give this a little shake. <laughs> Good. We got one out here. I'm gonna be something here. There. There we go. Perfect. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Hmm. I love the sauce. It's wow. You immediately get the chipotle and the sweetness from the carrot and not spicy, but a lot of spices. Well, the spiciness hits you afterward. It's not really like overpowering. Right. Yeah. It's it almost, it actually almost has a barbecue-y kind of flavor mm -hmm. with the chipotle and a sweetness. Um, I, man, I could see that being good on a lot of, a lot of things. I think... Right off the bat, I like I would actually put that on on barbecue barbecue sauce or barbecue. Yeah. Oh yeah. Before even putting any other any other sauce. Sauce. On it. Yeah. I think that would be a, a great like addition to like a pulled pork sandwich. Oh or, yeah. Well, and that's what I I tell people. You know, we're here trying it on a spoon, right on your tongue. You're yeah. Kind of getting a full shot of it. Yeah. But it's got a little bit of heat. But then yeah. once you put that on a sandwich and it's mellowed out with yeah. yeah pulled pork or some bread and everything, I mean it's just a just a hint of heat. Yeah. For um, sure. Yeah, her, her sauces are fantastic, extremely flavor forward. And um, yeah, I'm glad we could we could try that. Yeah, that's try that, that, one that that's a really great flavor. I like um, that. Perfect. Um, what kinds of places I know we've talked about um, like the food trucks and, and things like that and, and the mom and pop. Is there anything any other places that you kind of gravitate towards if you have you said, you know, okay, I'm going to this side of town and let's just say there's Five new places. I'm going with five a lot today, but let's say there's five <laughs> new places. Like, how do you how do you narrow it down from there? Is it kind of I feel like a burger today? I feel like tacos today? Or I feel like Thai today? Or where, how do you guide that? I think kind of that. I mean, it just depends on what my mood is. There's there's some there's some weeks that I'll go and then I'm craving burgers all week, or I'm craving wings all week, or you know, it's like for some reason I have that craving and that. So I always try to like find who's got you know, burgers on their menu, who's got wings on their menu for that, you know, if I'm on that side of town. Um, but yeah, it just depends on my mood. Um, but I try to like spread out the love. Obviously I try to spread out. Uh, I'm a huge breakfast guy too. So if I'm in an area, if I'm, if I have an early appointment and I'm in an area that has breakfast, I'll shoot in and grab breakfast. All about it. I mean, I can eat breakfast. Honestly, if you got a restaurant, if you're out there and you have a restaurant that has breakfast all day long, Ding, hit, ding, ding. Hit me up. <laughs> yeah. Your big brother will come through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's something. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm the same way. If it's even, I'm I'm almost like breakfast food for breakfast or breakfast food for dinner. Yes. Like sometimes I'm like, it's 7 o'clock, I want a Western omelet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or late, or the late night cravings, you know, I just want to grab some eggs and some fried, you know, potatoes. Yeah. You know, throw them in a, in a cast iron skillet and just go to town, you know. Yeah. What do you think? I know your your biggest following. I, th I think is Instagram, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah. What do you do? You do you feel like Instagram is the best place for what you're doing? Are you brand? Have you branched out to any of the other platforms? Or what um, do you, what's your feeling on all that? Well, I'm I'm on. I mean, I, I I'm, I've been on Facebook for a number of years, just like you know most people, um, and that's where kind of all got started. I did get hacked mm. on Facebook, which took some of my. Um, a lot of my followers on Facebook are from my original Big Rich Knows Jacks page. So I had to kind of restart over. Um, and then I recently started a TikTok as well. 
because everybody said you need a, you need a TikTok. So right. I was like, you know, I got to get a TikTok. Um, I'm thinking about doing like branching into YouTube, you yeah. know, as well. Um, I'm not the biggest like like editor and like filmer, like sure. So um, that's one reason why I haven't gotten into like the whole filming and like things right. of that nature and doing like uh, like the high resolution stuff. Right. But uh, yeah, my, I think Instagram has been my best. Uh, platform just because it does have a lot of different age groups on there. Mm -hmm. And I found that like looking at, at my statistics, um, most of my followers are in that 25 to like, you know, 45, 50 range. Um, uh, I mean, I have, I have all age groups that I've yeah. that are on there, but that's that usually the demographic that follows, follows me. It. And it seems to be that, Instagram is almost like if you already have your audience that are following you yeah. and like what you're saying is like, okay, you're pushing out content and it's someone that just moved to Jacksonville or they've been here however long and they can reliably go, okay, I'm going to go there. I'm going to see what to eat, do that. TikTok, and I guess since it's obviously newer than Instagram, seems to be more like, you know, you're going to be shown to random people that TikTok thinks are going to like your your page. So it's yeah. almost like it's got two different kind of things going on. Yeah, the algorithms are, are completely different when it yeah. comes to when it comes to the social media platforms. Cuz you probably post stuff on same stuff on both, right? And it just kind of, yeah, most yeah. of the time it's the same um, and I make sure that I don't cross platforms. Like I don't take a video that I did on TikTok and then just copy it. So you won't do any of that. No, no. So no. you make different stuff for each. And what I well, what I genuinely do is I make the video first. Okay. And I edit it on you know different like different uh, editing platforms and different apps, and then I post it that same video to the other platforms. So I'm not getting the the TikTok logo on my Instagram or vice versa. But is it is it one video? T typically, yes. So so if you went to John's Burger Place, you make a whole video, a spotlight on it, you edit it in third-party software, yes. and then you upload it to Instagram, TikTok, and exactly. wherever else. Because I wanted to be consistent, but, uh, and then, then there's some things that I just post to TikTok, and then there's some things that, that I just post to Instagram, but- and what's your threshold for that? Or what, what's different about it? Like, why? What, what makes you say, this is really a TikTok thing? Is it, like, sillier or goofier? Yeah. Okay. Typically, like, the sillier, like, yeah. you know, memes and stuff. Yeah. And, like, little... little Hook them in two seconds. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you know, anything that's, like, kind of musical related and things like that, that I can kind of gear towards the younger crowd or whatever. Um, but, yeah, I think Instagram has been my kind of, like, main platform for the longest time. Um, I do a, I do a really good job. I feel that of also vetting the followers that I have. Mm. You know, I don't you know I don't pay for followers. I don't you know I don't have like followers o overseas. All and, organic. Like there's you know because honestly the way I look at my following is if you have followers that are not local and you're trying to be a local representative, useless. It doesn't really matter how many followers you have. It doesn't benefit that small business that you're trying to promote. You know, if they if that small business asks you to come out and promote for them, or if you just want to promote them in general, it doesn't really do them any good that you got a hundred thousand followers if they're all overseas because right. that local business is not going to see any of those people, and that's what I really, you know, try to stay consistent on is mm -hmm. having a local following. Mm -hmm. You know, between Jacksonville and St. Augustine, that's the people that I choose. That's a lot of people. It is it's, a lot of people. It's like what a couple million or something? Yeah. I mean, I mean it's <laughs> yeah. a huge, huge amount of people. I think yeah. Jacksonville gets overlooked with Orlando and Miami and all sure. that, but it's a huge area. Well Jacksonville is its own thing. A lot of people are like, we need to be more like this this city. They're more no, we just need to be us. We need to be us and we just need to to grow it and be consistent with our growth. And yeah. You know, we don't, you know, we don't need to emulate any other city of what they're doing because it might not work here. More than likely it won't, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because we're not a tourist town. Right. You know, we're not Disney and we're not, you know, we don't have those type of things right. in here that, you know, what we love, what I love to have in a music park, you know, here. Sure. With, I would love to course. drive 30 minutes and not two and a half hours. But <laughs> Exactly. <yeah. laughs> but, you know, what I love is that, that we have kind of a, a small town, like, feel in a big city right you know because yeah. every, everything is spread out everything has got its place yeah um 
and you know it's a constant growth it's just yes. I, I love seeing more and more people move here that you know appreciate yes you know yeah and that's what i i'm i'm originally from up north and that's why i tell my friends and they kind of you know get the florida eye roll and i'm like that's fine <laughs> i was like come, come and visit but i'm like Jacksonville is this perfect spot of we got beaches and ocean. We have rivers. We have yes. country. We have city. We don't have mountains, but we have old city. We have yeah. new city. Um, I'm like, there's a lot going on here, and it's a great mixing bowl of kind of that physical stuff, but then also the community, yeah. you know, with what, two, three, almost four military bases here. Um, there's a lot of, you know, turnover in a natural way of folks coming to town that, you know, kind of inject different cultures and things sure, like yeah. that, which I think is, is really, really fantastic. So kind of circling back to doing the food reviews and things like that, was there, is there anything else? So I like how you really touched on the, um, side of eating on what it looks like, obviously what it tastes like. Is there anything else like that a restaurant does that kind of puts them in a, a top notch of places for you that's like, yeah, I like that. Or any, anything at all that you think is interesting? Um, I think that when, when you have the, an actual owner that's there on a regular basis, mm -hmm. that, that speaks volumes that they care enough to be there. Um, one thing that, that hurts business, in my opinion, is an owner that's absent. You know, I mean, it's one thing to like, take a day off because you deserve a day off. Everyone does, but nobody's going to treat your business like you're like you, mm -hmm. you know, nobody's going to, going to be consistent and be, you know, meticulous with, with, uh, with, with their, your business, except for you, you know, you can train people to do, to do, you know, right by you. But, you know, when I see an actual owner coming out to the tables and like making sure that you're okay, there's a couple of places that I've been going to for years mm. Because of the owners. Really? Yeah. It's because of the owners. They, they keeps me coming back because they're always there. They're always checking in on you. And they really love their customers. They really they appreciate you coming to, your, to the restaurant. And I support people more than I support a business itself. It's about the people for me. You know, because I know, like I said, I know what it's like to be in the kitchen. I know what it's like to, to put your own passion on a plate or – put yourself out there and, you know, hopefully people will support you. Mm. And so when I see people doing that, I want to support that at the same time. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. So I, I don't need specific <clears throat> names or anything like that, sure. but can you tell a story of a restaurant that came to you or we'll just say came to you that they were having some issues and then you turn them around and now you've seen a success with that? I mean, how long does that take and what kinds of things did, did, did you guys go through? Um, I mean, there's been a couple of businesses that I've, I mean, I've, I, I can't say that it was just me that helped them, but I think that my suggestions, uh, maybe them putting into, into action. Mm. Um, and the big one, like talk about consistency. I mean, I don't know if I want to name a name. No, no, no you don't but, have to. I'm, okay. just, I'm, just, I'm just curious okay. in general, like. But yes, I yeah, mean. Yeah, hey, this restaurant, they, you know, were getting. 30 heads a night and then we did X, Y, Z and now they're yeah. 60. Is there any, any stories like that you could share? Yeah. I mean, basically, like I said, I've had a couple of things of that. And there's one restaurant that was seeing, you know, a very inconsistency in one of their that one of their, one of their, uh, their side dishes. It was just something they weren't consistent on. On oh, like just the quality and the quality, taste like of the it? quality okay. and the taste and of they were it. Getting, they knew that they were, and they, they knew it. They just didn't know what, how to like, like, you know, how to fix it. And because of my food background, I kind of give them some, some tips in the food part of it. Um, and the reviews of that side dish kind of turned, turned up. Oh, that's great. It, it actually, like, people started ordering it more because of the new taste, the new flavor, the new consistency of it. Um, so what were they doing or not doing? Was it, like, not following or just kind of winging it? Well, the, the, <laughs> the problem was that they had no recipe, really. <laughs> they really had no recipe that everybody could follow. And that was the one thing. It was if the, oh, if the person who originally made it, the owner wasn't there and somebody else was making it, they weren't following a specific rest recipe. That's why I say consistency is key. If you have, if you're not, if like, if I go in there and I try this dish and it's not the same as I tried it yesterday, something's wrong. Right. Something's wrong because that means that you're, you know, right. the right person is not cooking it or they or there's no recipe. Right. Um, just like, 
you know, just like anything, you know, you want a nostalgic feeling, even if it's just yesterday, you know, there's, there, you know, it doesn't have to be 10 years ago nostalgia. If I went into a place and then I go in there next week, that's that, that feeling of nostalgia yeah. is still the same feeling because it's the same as I felt when I came in last week, you know, same thing with seeing the same people, like seeing the consistency in the people. It means a lot when you see people that you're comfortable with. You know, people. You're buy, talking about staff, staff, staff servers. Staff, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you got, if you have a lot of turnover in your staff, some there's a problem. You know, and that's another thing that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. You know, because and sometimes restaurant owners maybe not want to admit that. Oh, that's just them, right? Like, <laughs> well, well. Unfortunately, you know, not everybody's meant to be a manager of a of a of their own restaurant. So that's why sometimes you have to step outside of that box and bring somebody in who knows what their, their strengths are in that. Right. And um, you're wholly a third party. Right. So you can say, Hey, this is a problem. This is a problem. This is a problem. Right. And that, I've done that before with staffing because of my background. Um, and because of my sales background, you know, like it or not, as a server, you are kind of a salesperson oh, as well. hundred percent. Yeah. You know, you can help, you can help the, the sales of that, of that menu, you know, by making suggestions and that's something that I think that is missing today in a lot of restaurants is, is the servers don't make suggestions anymore. They just rely on the menu and what do you They're want? Order takers. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then that, what happens with, when you have nothing but order takers, everything goes digital. You know, obviously we, we, we just had that, the, the whole pandemic that everything was digital and we're trying to get back to actually serving and, mm -hmm. and people. But I think a lot of the training has gone away from actual serving and, and being a salesperson right. in the service industry. Right. So I think we need to bring that back. Yeah, for no, sure. That, that's fantastic. We had a guest on the show and his specialty was fine dining. And he actually, we had a whole conversation about talking about how not being an order taker, be a, yeah. a server and, and really a helper and educator on everything. And yeah. he was getting down to the business side of it, which I thought was so fascinating <clears throat> where just simple language and tweaks with like, Oh, let me, let me upsell them on a salad because yeah. from a, you know, it's a delicious salad. Sure. But from a business side, you know, we have really high margins on a salad. Right. So it gives people, it's, you know, everyone's winning because people get something to do. They get it quick. Yeah. It, the margins are good on it. The server's getting more of a tip because the whole bill's higher. Um, so yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot of fantastic things that, that come with that. Um, you ready for the next one? Sure. Perfect. Let's, let's go. Let's do this. So this is uh, from our friends out in San Diego, uh, Sean, and uh, his company, Down to Ferment. What's up, Sean? So, you know, one of the big things with hot sauce, of course, is having a high enough acid level or a low enough pH level um, to keep it shelf stable. Right. Most sauces are using vinegar to achieve that pH level. Okay. Um, what Sean and Down to Ferment, what they've, what they've done is basically made a kombucha hot sauce. So it's using the acid through that whole fermentation process. And kombucha, people fact-checking, kombucha might not be the exact right <laughs> language or word to use, but it's a fermented hot right, sauce. That's, right. the, that's the key to it here. Um, so the amazing part about that is you get um, you know, all the flavor of what's in there and then the whole other level of the fermentation process. Okay. Anyway, I'm talking a lot. Let's just try it. All right. Let's, I'm going orange this time. Yeah, it's got a little more pour onto mm -hmm. it. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Such unique flavor. Really tasty. So we stepped up in the heat a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so that one that one hit me on the on the on the throat a little bit, but but good flavor though. Yeah, so I think the main I'm guessing by the name. Um, yeah, the main pepper here is the orange <clears throat> habanero and yellow, yellow bell pepper, which I feel like you don't really see that a lot. And then the guero chili. And then this one also has carrot. I didn't even plan that for today that, <laughs> that had carrot as well. But yeah, that's got a real nice flavor. And this is one of my favorites on tacos. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that fermented taste kind of gives you a, it's almost hard. You know, I, I eat a lot of hot sauce and it's almost hard to put a finger on it. And I love that. I yeah. love that about it. Yeah, that's not like anything I've ever tasted as far as like, and I've never, 
heard of anybody myself doing hot sauce with fermentation. So, I mean, it's kind of genius to get that, that little bit of acid, extra acid t- flavor yeah. without, without the vinegar. Right. Actually, you know, using the fermented, like, vegetables and stuff like that. Right. Versus adding, just, just adding vinegar. Adding vinegar. Yeah, and there's been kind of a huge shift. I mean, there's, you know, ton of household hot sauce names that are primarily, like, pepper, salt, vinegar-based. Sure. And, um, you know, the hot sauce community, um, you know, kind of says, well, they're just making really simple stuff, and it's super bland, and it's really vinegary, and... And my response is, well, yeah, they're still super successful. <laughs> yeah, so there's still a lot of people. Yeah, that there's like a lot of people that 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 that's, yeah. that's, that's what they know and love because it's exactly. consistent. Yeah, which I, which I do too. Like I don't, you know, eat vinegar hot sauce every day, but when I want it, I want it. You know, yeah, there's a time and a place for it. Exactly, just like anything else in life. Exactly. So, but what I love kind of about that is kind of the boutique hot sauce. I'm not saying these guys, any of these guys specifically, but kind of the boutique um, hot sauce makers have kind of like put those vinegar hot sauces in their category. And what I love about that is <clears throat> everyone is finding ways to branch out from that to yeah. where you're getting, once again, from the first one, we tried a lot of flavor. This one here that's fermented, which, you know, I know exactly what that tastes like. I know what the fermentation tastes like. Right. Um, but if I had a sauce similar to this and was blindfolded, I don't know if I'd be able to identify it. I would just go, wow, what an interesting flavor. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I I, yeah. I love what they're doing. I, I think that's that's really fantastic. Like, um, I'm not a big seafood guy, but I bet that would be real good on some fish tacos or even, like, an addition to a little bit of ceviche or something. Yes. I mean, I've had those before. I'm just not – it's just not something that I tend to, to gravitate towards. Um, and I know a lot of pe- people, like, a lot of my foodie friends and, and followers – do enjoy the seafood, and I think that would be a really good addition to yeah. some some fish tacos or something. Or absolutely, and yeah, they're on the best coast, as they say. Yeah. Um. Well, cool. So we already we we're, we're touching on a lot of kind of the same things, but I think there's a and you know there's a lot of nuance to the whole category here. Mm-hmm. Where do you see? I know we just talked about how the iPads and other digital forms of ordering kind of like cropped up, and now. We'll, Everyone seems to be kind of beating them back. Where else do you see kind of the future? And we can you can speak locally or, or nationally here. <clears throat> the direction of restaurants going. Do you think more kind of going back to um, kind of the sit down or fast casual, or do you do you see? And I have a food truck question, but are the food <laughs> trucks kind of not making a comeback? But what what just what's going on with all that? Um, I honestly I believe that everything's kind of leveling off at this point where. People who love to go out to eat are, are going back out to eat. Mm-hmm. People who like dining at home, even if they're ordering out, they like to use the the whole all the platforms for ordering and delivering. Um, but I think with the food trucks had a big big surge, of course, when things were closed right. and like you really couldn't go to sit down because they could go to a neighborhood. They could go to, exactly, and yeah, and you know, and now I think it's leveling off where it's not as prominent in people's eyes with the food trucks because all the restaurants are back open and all the there's a lot more you know sit down places opening back up um so i think that's one of the reasons why some of the place some of the food trucks have uh started doing some brick and mortar options as well do you think a lot of people get into food trucks thinking like hey i'm gonna test my concept be mobile and then after a year or two i can tweak my menu and sticking with consistency, but I can tweak my menu kind of whenever I want. And then once I figure out something that works, I can open up a restaurant or do you think most people get into food trucks kind of ignorantly and blissfully of just, <laughs> I'm going to be a cook and this is the lowest barrier to entry. And what do you, th- what are your thoughts on all that? Well, I mean, I'm a little older than, than some of the people out here um, that are, that follow me and everything. And that I follow as well. Because I, I follow anybody and everybody, um, but I think that you had you do have some people that just like to cook, and you know, and and the food truck is a cheaper way of right. opening up a restaurant, in you know, in a sense, right? Because you could get a pull behind cart for a couple thousand bucks. I know some guys who started off with just a little hot dog cart and a flat top grill, and were doing tacos out of their backyard. So you can pretty much cook from anywhere and everywhere when it comes to wanting to cook and, you know, mm-hmm. wanting to, to create stuff, you know, 
So you don't have to have a restaurant. You don't have to have a food truck. You can even just, like I said, you can do, you know, whatever you want to do. If, as long as you're putting out good food, people will come. Right. You know, I, like I said, I start, I've seen people start from the bottom and now they're doing what they want to do. And some people may have the concept of wanting to go brick and mortar and food truck was the cheaper way of getting started and getting their name out there. But that becomes, <clears throat> and we've talked to some other guests where the, the tricky part can become, oh, you get your big following in Jack's Beach yep. and then you open up in Orange Park. And for, for those of you that don't know where that is, that's, you know, that's on the five minutes to an hour yeah, apart. That's I mean, on that's, the opposite side of the world. But yeah, and then they're like, the what beach. happened? I have no customers now. Well, that's the thing is you have to be smart with with the whole fact of um, figuring out where your demographic is, figuring out where your best like sales are being had. And if you're going to open up a brick and mortar, you have to do it on that side of town. Do you think a lot of food truck owners will, will, will dial into those kind of analytics? I don't know that they do. I think that that could be an issue with some people. Um, but if I had any advice to give, that would be it. You know, figure out where you have the best sales at. Figure out where you're, where you're like, where people love you. Right. Because they probably do it at a at a menu item level, of course. Sure. Because they have to know because they literally have to buy the food for what they're going to serve. Right. But you know, hey, whenever we're in Neptune or Mayport, it's we're popping off. Exactly. But what I would always suggest if, is if you're going to try to cater to the Neptune Beach or whatever, I wouldn't open up right in Neptune Beach. I would open up just down from Neptune Beach. That way you still get some people who are not in Neptune Beach that, mm -hmm. wanna, that will drive a 15 or 20-minute drive but mm -hmm. not a 45-minute drive yeah. to come see you. Yeah, 45 minutes, that's a, that's a commitment. I'm not going to be wrong. I've driven for food. And I will drive for food if, if it's what's, good food. What's the farthest you've ever driven just for just for a meal? Like, <clears throat> not oh, I'm going here, so I might as well hit this place. I mean, uh, Atlanta. Um, I did drive. Well, I mean, I was already going to Atlanta, so I can't really use that use as an excuse. Um, but I went to, when I went to Atlanta. I went. I, I definitely stopped at a, f a specific place because it was on diners, drivings, and dives. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. But because I always I'd always wanted to go there, and I just never had a reason to go to, to Atlanta. Um, I see. I've driven out to Fernandina Beach from San Marco, which is about a, about a good hour yeah. uh, drive um, to a little little uh, uh, privately owned little restaurant that served. Uh, they had like the, the, what what really drove me to it, and what I was like, I got to go try this. Yeah, is they had Southern barbecue and Korean barbecue on the same menu, <clears throat> and it's still there. It's still there. If you want to look it up, they go go find it. Um, Southern barbecue and Korean barbecue. You can get literally like bulgogi, same plate, same on the same. We get wow. bulgogi and and spare ribs on the same plate. You know, corn nuggets and you know, in in the the in the rice and kimchi and everything. Yeah. It literally like it, it blew me away when I saw the menu, so I had to go try it. And good, and it was fantastic. Yeah, people and what and what's funny is that it wasn't just one guy cooking both things. It, they have uh, uh, two kitchens. Really, two two they have kitchens. Two kitchens. They have a, they have the smoke master, pit master, and then they also have uh, the 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 wife of the one of the one of the owners doing all the Korean barbecue. That's amazing. Yes. So they like they were they were doing it and like you, it was fantastic. Yeah, that's that's really awesome. Presentation was great. Like the the vibe inside there was great, and it's it's really a great little place. Do you is there any type of cuisine that you see that seems to be in food trucks that then translates really well to a restaurant, or do you think it's a lot more about the grit of the the food truck and restaurant owner? I mean, obviously, I think I think. Um, Thinking outside the box is, is is great when it comes to food trucks, and it can translate to more of a brick and mortar because, you know, you can get, um, you know, fried chicken on every corner now. Right. You can, but you can't always get Korean barbecue on every corner. You can't mm -hmm. always get Mediterranean food on every corner, even though it's growing. You know, in our in our city, mm -hmm. you know, it's you know, it's a little less chance that you're going to find it in, you know, in, in every single neighborhood. Right. So I think that if you're smart about it, obviously 
you know, you I would even if you're doing brick and mortar, I recommend starting small. Some people go too big. Right. And the bigger your restaurant, the higher that cost. And you know, if you, people people don't know that getting a food truck is a lot cheaper, you know, even if you're making payments on that food truck, it's a lot cheaper than making right. lease payments on a restaurant. Right. And then rent and insurance and, you know, and electricity and it's you know it, it adds up real quick and if you're not prepared for it you know that's how you wind up and a lease is a lot harder to get out of than selling a food truck or correct doing something like that correct i was browsing around looking at real estate and i saw there was one i think it was in jack's beach and so you know the commercial is always like per square foot per year sure. and everything so i'm like hmm that seems like a lot so then i like i always got to know it like in the monthly the monthly yeah. rate it was like thirty thousand a month this. i'm like that's a that's a scoop. Yeah. That's a scoop for for a month. So you got to be really slinging some. I think it was a breakfast place too. I'm like, you need to, that's a lot of eggs. That's a lot of eggs. <laughs> a lot of toast. A lot of grits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Well, no, I, I love hearing that. All right. The last sauce we hear, have here, um, these guys are local local to Florida. Um, they're down in uh, South Florida. Okay. Um, they're really, really leaning into it. I love it. Um, hope to have these guys on the show here soon. Um, this is their scotch bonnet and guava hot sauce. Um, so a little, little sweet, little, little sweet, spicy. little heat. Yeah, this well, this one is uh, definitely moves up in the hot category. So let's uh, let's try it. All right, let's go. Let's grab the last blue, blue one out of here. Perfect. Whoa! <laughs> All right, here we go. Cheers! Cheers! Just immediate sweetness, then a little spice flavor, then the heat kind of sneaks up there at the end. Yeah. Mm. And then that kind of all goes away, and then the heat is still kind of lingering, but terrific flavor. Yeah, that 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 uh, that guava is really really nice on there. Yeah, and so the the two main peppers here are Scotch bonnet and habanero, and then the two big fruits are mango and guava. Mm. So, yeah, that's what's that's what I love about where this industry's headed is just everyone's getting so creative with everything that they're doing and yeah, I don't really and that's funny because the actual guava I don't really see as much in the hot sauces. That's a that's a good turn on that one because you see the more of the mango or pineapple being used a lot for the sweetness in a lot of hot sauces, but not not guava. And that's uh, that's that's a refreshing yeah change. Yeah, a lot of people were. I don't want to say hung up on, but hung up on mango for the longest yeah. time. And one of the reasons I think, and someone can fact check me on this, mango is one of the highest natural sweetness, sweet density fruits there is. So a lot of people like to do that because you can make your sauce hotter and then add in the natural sugar. Right. It doesn't count as added sugar. Sure. It's just in the fruit, even right. though it's a it's, lot. It's sugar from um, the fruit, yeah. But and that's what I tell people too is, you know, the the serving size you know is is set pretty small and yeah. um, but you know you're you don't use a lot of hot sauce especially if it's really hot yeah so um, well that's awesome so this is a question I, I love um, asking influencers and other people that are are in the the food industry here that really are dialed into restaurants and their audience and things like that what are some of the pet peeves of that you think restaurants have about their customers, you know, every anyone can write a Yelp review, Google sure. review, a social media review, the <clears throat> Facebook groups. We all we've all seen them, but restaurants and not that they not that they should <laughs> call out their individual customers, but <laughs> restaurants don't have a place to write reviews about their customers. But what are some things that you think a restaurant would want their customers to know on a on a pet peeve or? <clears throat> If a restaurant could review, well, something. I mean, I guess some of the feedback that that because I've actually gotten feedback from some restaurant owners about their customers that what what they would like to see more of is is internal feedback. You know, is it you that has a problem, not the restaurant? You know what I'm saying? Right. D is you know, just because you don't like something doesn't mean it's not good. Right. Which is why I tell people my, I'm not the end all be all when it comes to food. You know, I know what a lot of food is supposed to taste like just yeah. because I had to cook it. But there's things that I don't like that a lot of people love. 
But I think that a lot of a lot of what people do is they're they're digital warriors out there, and mm-hmm. they like to like hear themselves be be heard. Good warriors and bad warriors. Bad, yeah, bad and good. Because <laughs> I'm, you know, I've I've seen them both. Both. Yeah. But I think what a lot of people get very brave on the internet. If they would just give the feedback to the owners, and that's what a lot of the owners come to me. If they would have just said something while they were here, maybe we could yeah. fix it, or you know, maybe, we don't know about it until you let us know about it. Right. But doing it online blasting people on on Yelp and Google and Facebook groups and stuff. That right there to me is more cowardice than anything. Right. If I have something to say to you and you know oh, yeah. I'm, I would I because I respect somebody enough to say it to their face. Especially like a restaurant cuz I want to see them succeed. If if all you're doing is being negative, you obviously don't want that that restaurant to succeed. And if you say you do, then you're lying because why would you put it out there like that to, for, you know, hundreds and thousands and sometimes millions of people to right. see if you weren't trying to like hurt somebody or just more, or what happens is you're trying to make your feel, yourself feel bigger, Yeah, you know? Right. You know? Yeah. It's so, I mean, this has been discussed so many times in sure. so different ways, but yeah, being able to hide behind that digital yeah. wall, it's just, I can say whatever I say, whatever I want, like. Stuff that people leave in comments. I mean, because comments are like a whole nother lower level of accountability. Sure, yeah. I mean, a post is like, okay, there's moderate accountability. If it's Facebook, it's like, okay, you know, it's, you know, they can see who you are and stuff. But a comment is like, I mean, yeah. people will say anything. It's crazy. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And the thing is, is that, you know, obviously you can block those people, you can restrict them where they, you know, they think right. that. But like Google, there's very little recourse to <laughs> and this person that never even came to my restaurant. Right. Oh, sorry. That's and that's me. a problem that I think that needs to be solved by Google and Yelp and that, that there needs to be some type of transaction like reported. Like you right. have to be able to have a receipt. Right. Cause Google has verified purchase or Amazon has verified purchase right. and things like that. So there, that needs to be, ha- that I like that to, they're like scan a receipt in. <clears> and that and, needs to, in order for you to give a review, I feel that you should have to show your receipt. I love that. If you don't have a receipt to show that receipt, then you can't do a review on it. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Why not be there? Be be some type of permission, right? You know, slip that 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 right there. That little would, receipt would flush that out real quick. Yeah, because you know there are some vindictive people out there, or there's also some um, other, unfortunately, other restaurant competitors. That will get people to do bad reviews on a, on a competitor's restaurant, basically just to downplay that. Yeah. And I don't think that's right either. But there's, like you said, there's really no way to to like flush out who's real and who's not. Right. If they've ever if they've ever actually tried the product before. Yeah. So I think having a receipt should be like a mandatory right or like even requirement. And I get people say, "Well, I had a bad experience. I didn't even get a chance to buy anything." Okay, <clears throat> fine, but have a different tier of review or weight it a different way or, or something. Well, and here's the thing. I've also, I also don't think it's right if people to write, write a one-star review on a place that they couldn't get into because it was packed. Yeah, that's, I mean, my goodness, that means that the place is popular. (laughs) You know, you can't fault the restaurant for that. That's not their fault. Right. You know, they're doing something right. So why don't you get there a little earlier next time as a customer you know, oh, I've I've had that. I pull or up or maybe go, or maybe not go on a Friday or Saturday night yeah. to try the restaurant for the first time. Yeah, because obviously that's when most people go out. Yeah, you know, most people go out to eat on Friday and Saturday nights. Yeah, so why would you want to put yourself out there to go to a restaurant that already has five stars? On their Google rating, I'm gonna find a way to give it a one. Exactly. Yeah, I couldn't find a parking space, so one star. <sighs> I've seen that. Literally, I've seen that. <laughs> oh man! Um, well, th- well, this was awesome. What's uh, what's in store for us for 2024? Yeah. Anything new projects or anything you want to tease? Um, well, I mean, I'm, you know, thinking about um, doing a show myself um, in in the upcoming months. Uh, I've been approached by a couple of people that say I should be doing some type of 100%. podcast or, or you know, YouTube show or stuff of some sort. Um, it'd be, of course, it would be probably more of a travel show mm-hmm. so I can go to different places. Um, you know, I'm still working with the food trucks. I'm still working promoting 
like local food trucks. I'm still, you know, I have my other page, obviously. Um, I don't know if I want to, if you want me to say that other page. Yeah, no, uh, at the end here, I like to wrap up with where, uh, where people are the best place for you yeah. to follow you. So yeah, I mean, great. obviously you can find me on, on social media at big rich knows jacks on everything. Um, I also run a page. If you love food trucks, like I love food trucks, I have a separate page that's all about food trucks called Food Trucks of 904. Perfect. And that really, you know, if you want to find out where they're going to be. And, oh, right. that's that's <clears> the <throat> hardest thing and and getting them where they're going to be because some of them are only on one type of platform and, and everything else. So. Right. And so I, I post their 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 menus for the week and, you the know. Menus too? Yeah. Like the, if they have a new menu, or, you know, I'll put that on my stories or I'll put that in with uh, with their, their uh, schedule for the week as well. Um, typically, you know, I try to repost whenever they post, uh, to let people know that they're going to be out that week and where they're going to be, uh, any new events that are popping up, any markets, any like, uh, like, you know, new events that are happening that involve food trucks are on there as well. And then of course I also post that in my stories on, uh, big rich nose jacks. Um, and it's not just about food on big rich nose jacks either. It's pretty much all types of businesses. Oh, cool. Um, you know, I, I don't, you know, obviously I'm not a customer of for everything, but I know there's a lot of small businesses that need a little push yeah. and I will throw them up on my store regardless of their restaurant or a food yeah. product, you know, because, you know, if 60% of my following are females, maybe they would like this jewelry or this crocheted like outfit or, right. you know, maybe they, that'll help you know, that small business find a new customer. Yeah. So I don't have a problem with, you know, with posting and, and, and you know, putting in the story because it doesn't take but a second to do it right to just you know share it yeah you no, know, I, why not i love that that's why i say why not <laughs> yeah no exactly and we'll end it there so thank you so much this was great yes thank you I, I enjoyed it a lot thanks for listening to the hot sauce show be sure to follow us here and on socials to stay up to date on future episodes